you take your seats. And um, the next um, topic we want to discuss is um, uh, preterm rupture membranes and premature rupture membranes. And I know there's many uncertainties in the space about what you do and how you do it and antibiotics, not antibiotics, when you induce, won't you induce. And uh, so um, I hope this will give you a bit of a structure which you can then uh, apply and, if necessary, persuade people to maybe do things a bit differently. So um, once again, Paul, thank you very much for uh, doing this. Um, and we've also got here Kate Brown from Peninsula Health and Emma McKenzie from Ballarat Health Service and Chrissy Quinn from Cabrini Health. So once again, thank you guys for your contribution and for doing so much hard work. And once again, Felicity, who's sort of been sort of, you know, the person who's been back there doing all the other work. <laughs> Um, now, can I change these? Yes? Yeah. I can. Yep. All right. Uh, so we'll be talking about term prom and P prom. And it was clear from our early discussions there was a great deal of variation in uh, the uh, approach to care for these women. So uh, what we've included in our pathways uh, for term prom is uh, patient information, uh, including uh, a process for uh, self-assessment if the patient's going home uh, for, ex uh, for expectant management, um, advice about risk factors uh, and uh, advice about active or expectant management. The antibiotic regimen, uh, this is where one of the biggest variations we discovered. So we've aligned that with the PPROM pathway and also the neonatal uh, e-handbook so that hopefully we can bring some consistency right across the board with the antibiotic regimens that are used and also uh, a section uh, on the management of the newborn. For um, pre-PROM we've divided it into uh, three gestation specific uh, flow charts which was quite challenging um, and also a focus on being aware of your services capability level. Uh, again, the antibiotic regimens have been aligned with uh, the term PROM and the neonatal e-handbook. Um, and we've given probably some uh, new advice on corticosteroids in particular and uh, also tocolysis and magnesium, again aligned uh, with a preterm labour pathway. Uh, and also, of course, early consultation with Piper if that's needed. Right, I might ask our, um, our panel here if there are any areas of this that they wanted to, to raise specifically. I think the, the steroid issue up to 36.6 was quite an interesting one for me. I think the steroid issue was something that a lot of... Um, sorry. A lot of clinicians will find the steroid issue something new because the evidence um, is now pointing the fact that we've collected data on the, um, the efficacy of steroid use in the later gestations. It's enough to support the fact that we do use it, we should use it up to 37 weeks. I think this emphasises the changing world because I know the WHO have brought out guidelines and I think they're coming up to 34 weeks. So I guess, in fact, it emphasises how much different evidence is out there. And I'm always fascinated by evidence-based guidelines. Guidance. Um, get it right, Tippett. But in fact, um, you know, we look at level one evidence, level two evidence, level three evidence, four, five. And then we look at it and we see these things are level four evidence, level five evidence. And really that's opinion. And so opinions are going to vary. It always is very emphasised by another type of grading, which we tend not to use in Australia, called grade. And so it tells you the strength of the evidence and the strength of the recommendation. So you'll have a recommendation that's a higher grade and the strength of the recommendation, which is a lower grade. So you've got people there who are very passionate about something, and of course that will change. That's why we see there's not uniformity in guidance, the guidelines around. So people can argue the point and somebody can get up at your at your, your health service say da 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 da, what we're trying to do is actually put together what's a reasonable, appropriate way forward. So um, what about MagSelf? Did one of you, who was the MagSelf queen? That 
Oh, oh, oh what, no, by no means am I the MagSolve Queen, but um, it was recommendation, so it was just based on evidence, and that's what's suggested to do now. So that's why we included it. That? Sorry? Do you want to articulate that? Uh, well, what, uh, what we've recommended? Well, it was just research to show that um, it helps the um, the um, baby if it has the uh, mag sulfate for transfer in preterm. Yeah, OK. So, in fact, in what gestation? 30 weeks. Yeah. 30 weeks. And so the other question is, in fact, I saw somebody from AV here. Is he still here? Hi, how are you? Um, I'm not, sorry, I don't know your name. I apologise. Hi. I think we might have met before somewhere in the past. <laughs> um, Ian, what's the situation with AV and transporting people with mag self infusions going? Okay, that's good, because in the past, because of MagSolf's risks, um, there was a reluctance to transfer women with MagSolf. So I'd be interested, in fact, if anybody in regional areas do sometimes come across some resistance to um, transfer people with an, a MagSolf infusion going. No? That's great. Sorry? Okay. Okay. All right. So look, I'm, I'm interested. I, it's not a very important question. So, can somebody please put up your hand? You might want to speak. I understand that. If you've had issues with transferring people with mag self infusions going, thank you. I thought there might be some. That's some time ago. Sorry. Some time ago. So it's actually got better. See, I'm out of date. Okay. That's all good. Okay. I think uh, one thing I've seen is uh, people. Uh, ignored fetal distress to get mag sulfate on board. So again, that mm. comes down to individualising the patient. So I think these things have to be taken in the clinical context. You know, if a baby needs to be delivered immediately, don't wait for mag sulfate and don't wait for antibiotics. Just oh. get it out. It does my head. And same, we've got a sort of a terminal CTG and somebody wants to do a fetal scalp, you know, sample. Hello. It's the same with this. If you've got an abnormal CTG and you put up mag sulfate, particularly if the mother's blood pressure drops a bit, it's all over Red Rover. It just doesn't make sense. So you're going to make the baby hypoxic um, in utero from you know, just staying there longer when you could have got it out. That's going to be much worse for it than not having mag salt. But it's just a sort of, you know, absolutely imperative. I've got to do it. It's in the guidelines. So that's why I come back to, you know, the person in front of you is the person you've got to treat. And sometimes that means making, what do they call it in my hospital? A guideline violation. <laughs> I kid you not. I've even known a risk man to be put in. <laughs> because it's a guideline violation. Well, that just really, that, no, that's a very concern because that really means that, you know, the team aren't talking, the people aren't communicating, and there's a degree of antibodies floating around. And as we all know in maternity services, antibodies are not good for mothers. Okay. Are there some other issues you'd like to bring up with the, the from one? People? Can I ask, if you send somebody home, what are you telling them to do? Do they have to take their blood pressure, are their um, temperature and their pulse twice a day and ring you for temperature? So, so in the guideline, there is a um, information sheet. Yep. And it's quite explicit about what to do and what not to do, and it's got a place on it too that they can record their temperature yep. and instructions about when to come back and when to ring if there's any concerns. Okay. Because, in fact, I think that's something that, you know, we know women like being at home. It's hard if they've got three other kids under five or something. But particularly if it's the mother having her first baby and she's in a reasonable distance the hospital, it's a very reasonable thing to do. And, um, you know, we've done it for a long time. We haven't regretted it. I'm sure some places do. But once again, some people who are more conservative want to keep them in the hospital. So I think this gives you, you know, things like, OK, this is an OK thing to do and this is what we give the women. And that I hope that'll be helpful. Um, other things? No, I just uh, would do people find it useful for us to have divided it. If those of you who had a chance to look into the three gestational groups, because uh, I think um, uh, a one size fits all approach obviously isn't working for those intermediate just preterm gestations. So I, I thought this was a really good way of uh, dividing it up. So 
opinions on that? I realise you some didn't get the link till last night. Oh, sorry, but in fact, uh, we really would appreciate your feedback. So if you mm. can go back and have a look at it and get back to us. And the other one that I think is really valuable is prom is somebody who's GBS positive or somebody who's um, GBS not known, and that aligns with the neonatal handbook as well. Because you know, that's always a difficult situation. Um, and you know, it's like many things these days. We just err on the side of caution, and sometimes. You get a bit carried away. So there was a question up the back. Oh, I'm just giving you a thumbs up. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all good, right. Sorry about that. So your emoji, hey? Okay, well, it's not an emoji, I'm told. It's uh, something else. It's only an emoji when it's a face. So my granddaughter told me. Um, okay. So anyway, okay. All right. Well, you sure there are no more questions? I mean, this is a hot topic, guys. There must be things that you don't know about or you want to know or you'd like to know more about. Yeah, the variation, particularly with the antibiotic treatment, was astonishing. So, uh, and particularly because I think the uh, the uh, neonatal handbook had, you know, good consistency there. We can match with that. So that that's great. So hopefully that could be something to, you know, potentially audit, you know, your, your uh, use of that those recommendations. It's, it's a bit like the work that was done when I was doing the um, vector chart. Um, and that was extraordinary. I think some of you will have heard that talk for the, the number of, you know, rests a minute, which are normal and some are abnormal, and the pulse rate and the whatever you have. It was the variation was extreme. One baby who was, you know, on this chart meant to be at death's door, the other baby was just happily floating along. Um, and so um, it is um, getting it back. And we do know that one of the things we can do to help is to reduce variation. Oh. I think that's a fire alarm. I think we're meant to leave. Okay, it's okay, we can stay now. Um, we we so, forgot to give fire instructions at the start of the day. I told you we're yeah, right. um, <laughs> So yes, yeah, so no, it is, it is that reduction variation. We stop and think about it, there's a lot of sense to it because probably not so much our midwives, but particularly our medical staff, they're going from hospital A to hospital B to hospital C, and it's different every time. And if it's the same, you don't then, as a nurse unit manager or the A&M in charge, then have to have a prolonged discussion with some young doctor about why you do it differently. So maybe it'll help you in many ways. Okay, well, I think we might um, move on. Okay, all right. Okay, so the next topic is um, preterm labor. And this is a really fascinating topic. And why is it fascinating to me? Because in fact, I talk about the way you treat preterm labor like treating every case of pneumonia with tetracycline or doxycycline. You know, we seem to forget we, the difference where it comes from, but we don't know that, so we treat them all the same. So why are we surprised? It doesn't always work. So, um, so, so we've got um, so Mark Ferruja from Kyneton and Anne-Marie McKenzie, who's still here, and Andrea Moore from Kilmore. The Ks are getting a good look in, and once again, Paul. So, um, Paul, you're on again. Yeah. <coughs> So this was another uh, important topic and it does link uh, with the previous ones in terms of PPROM. Uh, so our key points, I guess, uh, in preterm labour are really to focus on an emphasis on the awareness of your service's capability and, you know, understanding too that capability can change, uh, particularly for the smaller services from time to time. Uh, there is information on uh, prevention of preterm labour because there's quite a lot of evidence about that in recent years and hopefully this will be a starting point uh, to help prevent preterm labour. Uh, but also assessment and management of women in preterm labour. We have flow charts as well for assessment and, and management. Uh, the antibiotic regimen uh, is uh, aligned with the previous topic and the neonatal e-handbook. There's also advice on discharge and follow-up and some suggestions on, on what we can uh, look at in audits. Um, and obviously, you know, Piper uh, need to uh, be informed and be involved in, in these discussions early on. Okay, Mark, did you want to uh, make any uh, comments at this point about what you found uh, new or different with these? Uh, 
From um, a country sort of hospital point of view, uh, in particular the fetal fibronectin, we don't have that. We've, I think we've just got um, positive or negative. Taking that binary conversation to a more nuanced conversation um, will make the discussion with Piper a little bit more um, interesting and able um, resource allocation a bit easier. Uh, was one of the things that I took away. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you want to elaborate on that? I think sometimes uh, we might not have access to retrieval as quickly as what we would necessarily like. So with um, instead of the binary being, oh, they need to be somewhere else, uh, they might need to be somewhere else later on. And uh, so I think that makes it a, um, the piper's job is a little bit easier in um, getting the ambulance to us and uh, finding a place for the woman to go. And I, I think also, you know, obviously Piper is a difficult job and it can be challenging at times uh, and, and you might be relatively low on their priority list, but it might be a really big deal for you. And, and I think it's very important to, to keep the discussion at, at the top level and make sure everyone's on the same page. And I just had another discussion with colleagues from Kilmore where they really were forced into making a decision to deliver preterm babies because there was no one to take them and, and therefore then when they were delivered the, the care uh, level wasn't appropriate. So we, we want to try and avoid those situations. What about the, uh, uh, again we had a lot of variation in antibiotic usage and tocolysis. Uh, yeah I suppose uh, everywhere I've worked uses nifedipine first up. Um, we haven't included the second and third line agents, but I suppose uh, we can implement those uh, if necessary, but it's good to start with a, a common common ground. That's, you know, I can't remember the last time I even needed to use something second or third mm -hmm. line. So, yeah. Chris, have you got any thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I think that a is very safe, and it's much better than we used to use um, ventilin infusions and put them up in diabetic mothers and they got ketoacidotic and the babies died. That wasn't always a good look. Um, but, um, but you know, we do always think the thing is that is really good, which we hate using, is indomethacin. That is the best tocolytic we have. And, you know, there might be an odd occasion, but probably not in Victoria, where you can use that when you really actually have to stop somebody, maybe very, very early on. And yes, I know it can cause um, change to the psychological maze and produce fetal urine output and it can work with premature close of ductus, but a single dose is not going to and it can work really well. And the other thing is, of course, sometimes the narcotics will sometimes work. Um, but, um, but yes, I think most times you don't have to work that hard. It is difficult. And one of the things that um, I find is you get rung up when I have my new pipe for 12 months, but I was doing it. Um, people would say, it's a weekly positive fetal fibronectin. And then they'll say, oh, I've done a scan. I say, well, what's presenting? Done a scan, the head's down, but where's the head? So all those other clinical things as clinicians, so is the head high and floating? Well, if it is, probably not a lot happening. Is the cervix long and closed? Oh, I haven't done a vaginal examination or a fetal fibronectin, but you can always do it after you've done a fetal fibronectin. And, um, you know, in some of these very big women, some of you might be better than I with a speculum. But, you know, it's a bit like, where's Wally? Find the cervix. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you just have a, have a feeling. They have got intact membranes. That's a very sensible thing to do. Um, especially, in because I, I know you're on Piper, there's no bears and everybody's shut. So when do you call it, you know? You know, a critical time transfer, and when don't you? And sometimes I'll encourage people. And what the other thing that happens sometimes is people ring, as soon as a woman hits the place, they sort of ring and you think, well, just hang on, just, just sit there for 30 minutes and just see what happens. Because the cervix long and closed, the baby's not going to deliver in the next 30 minutes. So it's all those nuances, and this is actually there to sort of give you that basic background underpinning of what we do. Um, but it is difficult, and um, you know the, the bed state is a, a chronic one, of, uh, and it's not going to get particularly better unless we can work out why we can go into preterm labour. And as I said, there's many different causes of preterm labour. And I think you talked too about um, progesterone and cervical mm. circlage, yeah. and um, just to add, you know, we're the best we can do it at the moment, but just to add some more uncertainty, um, there was a recent um, analysis that came out on progesterone <coughs> and it looked at all the progesterone RCTs, of which I think there were 22 that passed the test. So what they set out and what their endpoints, they were sort of true to the endpoints. Um, and a lot of them weren't, didn't follow up their endpoints, so they were invalidated. And then they looked at the 29 meta-analysis of the 22 RCTs 
and they came to a neutral point. They didn't know if it worked or not. And the same with cervical cerclage. I'm sure it works in some women, as cerclage works in some women. But I said at the very beginning, we don't know which women. Which women have got increased inflammatory markers? Which women is because they're obese or for some other reason? I'm not talking infection here. I'm talking sort of subtle inflammatory markers. Obesity is an important one. Diabetes is an important one. Which have got a truly cervical incompetence, which in some ways, you know, to me as a cervix, it's um, uh, anatomically damaged or congenitally incomplete. And that's actually very uncommon. But these days we put a stitch around and hope for the best. Debbie? Yeah. What do you think about, like, we've got something in there about uh, progesterone doesn't work in twin pregnancies, but um, do you say to somebody who's had, you know, repeated losses or their cervix is opening up, we're not using, we're not using something that has no side effects because it doesn't work? Do you, like, I, I never know what to think about the use of a placebo effect or do you tell them it doesn't work, you still use it? I, I think that's a tricky one. I think we're all in that situation that yeah. doing something and giving something is often easier than doing nothing. Mm. And often, you know, we hear this all the time, patients want you to do something. Mm. And, you know, if somebody comes to you and they've been told they need a stitch in the next pregnancy and you say, I don't need you need a stitch, let me tell you, you sort of, personally, I get very anxious about it, particularly the one that recently was a, an Indian couple who seemed to have every other member of the family except for the husband was a doctor in India um, and they'd come with all this advice. I said, I don't need, need a stitch. I'll tell you what, I sighed with relief when she got to 36 weeks and by the time she got to 38 weeks she wanted to be induced and I thought, <laughs> right, okay. But it is difficult and um, mm. I don't think there's any doubt about that. And you know, talk, talk down and we often talk about cases at the end of the clinic and, um, you know, well, we different ones, ones of us have a different, different opinion. opinion. Um, and I think that's fine and recognising that difference but working from a base of commonality is okay and yes look if people women get pretty desperate at the end of the day what's a bit of progesterone between friends yeah I, I, yeah I must say I've used it in that circumstance explaining that it probably the evidence is it doesn't work but sometimes people do feel they need to be doing something yeah. as long as it doesn't have side effects I yeah. suppose as long as we have an RCT we're happy but in fact we all know that the sort of the mm. the nuances and things of RCTs and I think um, yeah that's why I come back to the fact education and um, you know, understanding is such an important part of what we do. We can't just run on guidance, guidelines, protocols. Got a question somewhere? Hi, I'm Manny Doreen with two small pregnancies. Twenty years ago, uh, I had a That would be the ideal. I'd invite you to join in one of the teleconferences we have when beds are tight. You just go around. The cannot afford to one hospital or another because, in fact, you'll risk the babies that are there anyway. And it is that tight. So, absolutely, I think it's awful when you send a baby from, say, um, Horsham to Monash. I mean, you know, what's that about? And we send them all around the state. What is it that perceived lack of resources? If you're in a tiny little hospital, pretty soon it's going to be a little bit of a problem. Yep. That's going to be I get that. But if you've got, you know, 42 babies ventilated, you're meant to have 35, um, you're not going to have a ventilator. And um, you really, and staffing, particularly things like Christmas and school holidays, Staffing, which is high intensity staffing in these areas, is really a problem. So it tends to be worked out, um, and I'm not aware of babies not getting somewhere. But yes, they don't go to the ideal place, which is very inconvenient for families. Um, and you know, people feel away from home anyway. And sometimes then there's sort of the silly thing they get discharged and they go back to somewhere else different. So that history's there and they can't get access to the history here. So look, they're very real problems, and we've been struggling with. Um, number of neonatal intensive care beds. They've been increased over the last five years, but of course they haven't been done with a consequent increase in special care beds and maternal beds. And, um, you know, as I've said in the department, more than one occasion, when a mother comes with a baby neutro, there's only one person, but when the baby's out, there's two people. So if you give us one bed, you've got to give us two beds. 
Um, and so then you impact on your own service and how many beds you can have and you get bed block and people stuck in birth suites. So look, I, look, I take your point and I know, you know, classic is in fact when I've been up in New Guinea doing stuff and, you know, I go there to, especially up at WeWAC and I wanted to give them a flyer. I said, can we photocopy? They said, oh, we don't have any paper to photocopier. And uh, at another place I was there and the fire alarm kept going. I did my head in so I went and got some batteries. They wouldn't let me put the batteries and fire alarm, they all wanted for their Dopplers. So in fact, resources are all sort of varying. So yes, I know it's difficult. And I think Piper really, considering it does a very good job, and let me tell you, if you had to ring around like you used to, that would be just, that would just do your head in. I think also uh, there's some positive things. So Sunshine are going to become a tertiary hospital with another neonatal intensive care unit. And some of the level two hospitals have, uh, or level five, I should say, have increased their their special care nursery beds. So. Yeah, and the, you know the CPAP capacity. That's been one that I know has been fraught with sort of um, difficulty and uncertainty with the change in some of the capability levels of um, three of the hospitals, I think. But I know that's something that's being talked about again. In other words, trying to keep mothers where they can. Of course, that's not just about having. CPAP facilities is also about having the staff and so some of your areas will have a paediatric registrar who was doing orthopaedics last the, last week and sort of general med the week before and so then you put them in charge of a baby on CPAP you know you just hope you've got a really great um, GP obstetrician and we know they're the backbone of rural services so yeah look it is difficult um, I can tell you from, from working in far north Queensland where Brisbane was way too far away to transfer anyone and Townsville always said no, uh, I, I can appreciate your concerns. And then you'd get asked to please explain why you delivered this 24-weeker and you, you, you had no choice. So I, I think we just need to keep the conversations productive and civil and obviously raise these concerns when we can. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Other questions, concerns about how your health service copes? Yep. Can you turn your mic on again? Just a green button, please. Just a question about antibiotic cover. Um, you've got three grams initial. Um, your reference thing has got 1.2 and 600, so I just wondered where you got it from. We just checked that. Queensland Health do 1.2 and 600. So, so we've got three grams in one spot, one point two in another. Yeah, um, the guide the guidance says um, three grams, and then one point two every four hours. Yes. The reference in the Queensland oh, okay. underneath it says one point two and six hundred, which is what we do at our hospital. And I thought, where is the evidence for three grams? So uh, a lot of where is the evidence for one point two? And that's that's the, I rest my case. And that's the problem that in fact we say things are evidence based guidelines. Yeah. Most of the evidence is not watertight. Most of the evidence is open to interpretation. And uh, you know, I suppose you'd think, you know, penicillin is a relatively safe drug. Um, how much is enough? We probably don't really know. So, you know, the people who wrote the Queensland guidelines thought that, that was a good thing. This one we've written this. And so lots of things like that will vary. Um, it's also aligned so with an email. Okay, the neonatal, the neonatal yeah. handbook. So, that's, yeah, yeah. So it's important sorry, the, they came from the therapeutic guidelines as well. The okay. three and the 1.8 okay. is Thanks from there. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. But it's, it is an example of how yep. each hospital has something different because it tries to find its own resources and, and review yeah. the evidence. And, and this is, hopefully we'll standardise it and we base it on the best recommendations we can. So Queensland, as you know, has statewide guidelines that have been developing and we put a lot of money in it over the years. Um, and so Victoria, because we have a different type of governance of our hospitals, Queensland have a centralised governance structure, which in fact, the central government says thou shalt, and they do. Whereas here we've always had what we call a devolved governance um, structure, where the health service have a degree of autonomy. And that's clearly changing. Um, I don't think it's been articulated at changing. But currently, that's not something that is actually used as part of our governance structure. So it's becoming much more trying to unify care, make it uniform across the state. So we're very much hoping this will be part of that process. Yep. Chris, um, in the, where it came from in the neonatal handbook, in 2010, um, CDC updated their um, algorithms for GBS prevention. Can you hear me? 
Yep. Yeah, okay. they recommended the three grams because it gave a better circulating antibiotic in the foetal circulation. Okay. So after that, a lot of health services in Victoria were changing to the three grams and the 1.8, and that's when it changed in the neonatal e-handbook. So CDD is the Centre for Disease Control in the States, which many of you know. Um, so thanks for that. That's great. Thanks, Pam. Pam knows much things. Yes? Yep. Press the button and the light should go green. That one doesn't want it very much, does it? We've got one, one here while we're waiting. Yep, OK. Um, just with regard to your prevention strategies, I see that um, for women with a history of preterm birth, that both uh, progesterone and cervical cyclage is recommended. Uh, are you suggesting both or an oh, either no. or in approach? Fact, in fact, there's actually a caveat on that. I was looking at it last night. I think it's, no, it's one or the other. But in fact, um, well, you know, there's always debate to put a stitch in to use progesterone as well. Oh, it's sort of called backing both horses, isn't it? Um, but no, I think in fact, and equally, I think it says that there is some uncertainty as to the efficacy of both. Is that not the case? I, I do think it's a little ambiguous in the way we presented it. So okay. I think that's something we can look at, Jolly. So okay. thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, it says or. Okay. There is an or on the card. <laughs> Maybe the all involved. Yep. Hello, I'm Julie Blanthorne from the Royal Women's Hospital Alcohol and Drug Service. I'm just wondering whether there's anything in the guideline around opiate withdrawal as a cause for preterm labour. Because at the women's, we often get um, women who are transferred from uh, other hospitals who are on methadone or buprenorphine or using heroin, and um, they are, well, they're on methadone, they, the, the dose needs to increase during pregnancy, and often they go into preterm labour, they have an irritable uterus when they're withdrawing, and they come down to the women's because they're in preterm labour, when really all they need is to up their dose of methadone. That's, we don't have that. We've obviously got smoking as a cause, but that's good information, so we can include that as well. Thank you. I think there is very good evidence that you know women who are on opiates, who are on you know, whatever, really should stay on a dose or equivalent dose throughout and increasing throughout pregnancy to get the best outcome for the baby. And it's not surprising when you stop and think that the the whole you know when they withdraw, and I'm coming back to that whole inflammatory process sort of thing. I think it's fascinating. You have women with SLE, for instance that, you know, going along, well suppressed, and they come into labour, and two days later they have a flare of their lupus. <coughs> if they didn't get it just because they delivered the baby, they were getting it and went into labour. So there's all those background factors that I don't think we understand. Out of interest, uh, I'm not aware at my hospital, which does 3,500 births of really anyone, I, I wonder if they are going to the women's directly for their pregnancy care. We probably don't have the same degree of drug and alcohol support as you do. So are these rural transfers here? Yeah. Yeah. Come to, well, I hate to know how many we have at Monash now. How many a year would we have? Kerry? How many drug people would we have in our DAPT clinic now? Yeah. yeah. So it's, uh, we see a lot of these women. Yeah. I, 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 Yeah, and of course they make babies sleepy that sometimes gets forgotten. The girls on codeine, you know, their babies come out and they sort of take a while to wake up. Okay. I'd just right. like to make well, a, little, a little quick comment. Thanks for that comment on the morphine, uh, the uh, methadone, because I don't think, um, I think there's a shortage of GPs who are prescribing methadone. So, um, and maybe the ones who are prescribing aren't involved in antenatal care, but I, I wasn't aware of that. So it's a good thing to know. Yeah, we have a few tame GPs who look after most of our women on methadone. I'm not sure the women's, if you had a few sort of go-to GPs, you would, I think, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's something people tend to see as difficult and often steer away from. And um, I think uh, that's a pity because these women do need a lot of care. They're very challenging. They don't come for appointments. They can be disrupted, all the other things that we all know about. Okay. So, all right. So, that's all great. So.